Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Can you, I hope so. Um, I'm coming to you from northern Vermont. <laughs> so uh, at times there might be a little lag in the connection. Hopefully uh, it will go smoothly. So I want to start by saying uh, good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to join in. I am extremely delighted to be with you virtually to discuss leading all times. Oh my, that sounds so ominous. <laughs> Hopefully though, this talk will inspire you to new ways of thinking and not just for these fearful times we are in. Uh, you've probably all uh, heard the quote you see here up on this slide. Um, quite honestly, uh, even before the far impacts of COVID dominated the world, news spreading unparalleled, unparalleled worry, anxiety, and instability across the globe, we all knew as that the world was getting increasingly VUCA, B-U-C-A, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. As managers, we must respond to the urgent needs that face us daily. And as leaders, we must see beyond the immediate moment to anticipate the next obstacles over this unknown arc of time. And last but not least, as human beings in these fearful times, we must find ways to meaningfully connect with others, all while maintaining our distance. <clears throat> so I guess I'd ask you to start contemplating right now. How are we doing? Think about that for a moment. <clears throat> if your uh, answer to my question uh, was, uh, is fantastic, uh, great. If your answer to my question is <clears throat> mezzo mezzo, not so good, I'm here to tell you that it may have a lot to do with how we are wired by natural selection. As humans, we start off with certain, what I'll call shortcomings. We were designed by natural selection to do certain things that helped us, helped our ancestor, ancestors to get their genes into the next generation. You know, things like uh, eating, having sex, earning the esteem of other people, and of course, outdoing our rivals. The word wired here on this slide is in quotes, because natural selection isn't a conscious, intelligent wirer, but an unconscious process. According to evolutionary psychologist Robert Wright, Natural selection does create organisms that look as if they're a product of a conscious designer who got them to pursue spreading their genes. In other words, I, me, um, is in control of me. I assure you that's a facade. We are not. Wright also makes the case of that, that natural selection doesn't really care if we're loving, happy, and flourish as human beings. It has nothing to do with positive psychology. Natural selection just wants us to be productive and spread our genes, as I said. And it wires us in such a way that causes us to have other wiring shortcomings 
that relate both to our sense of who we think we are and how we see the world. It's like the old song, you know, the knee bone is connected to the thigh bone. Everything here is connected. I call the sense of who we think we are as the problem of I, me, and mine. So uh, if you can see me, just imagine that you have these little um, antennas, P pretend you have these little antennas on top of your head, you know, like, a, like, a, like an insect, and are instantly going, I want this. Oh, I don't want this. I'm going to stay away. Um, and we're always looking for things that might threaten us. To protect us, based on the narrative we tell ourselves about what is happening. You know, if we see a rattlesnake, we are going to probably jump out of the way. So the mind's responsibility, natural re selection, is maintaining our sense of who we think we are. Our sense of self, our ego, and uh, our antennas manage us. And we hold off the things that conflict with our view of the world. So we like to have a place in our story of what is going on. So our inner narrative takes the agreed upon view, and again, unconsciously for most of us, and applies it to the details of our life constantly, okay? So it becomes our story, and then we become the storytellers of our story, right? And when our story is threatened, it's like the wagon circle and our defenses contract around our view. We believe that we alone know what is valid, reliable, and true, and mostly, most importantly, what is good for us now, okay? So the experiences that we perceive will threaten our view are denied, voided, dismissed, okay? And those that reinforce force our worldview are incorporated into our story. And we end up strengthening, as a result of the, our antennas, the uh, sense of I, me, and mine <clears throat> with every perception and decision that we have to make. Bottom line, as long as we can maintain our storyline, <clears throat> the view of what we think of as reality walls us off from others. It walls off from the people that have differing views, views that are contradictory or inconsistent with how we see the world. In short, our storyline walls us off from interconnection altogether. And that includes interconnecting, or I should say intra-connecting with ourselves and of course with others. It gets worse. Um, here's something, perception, in this. perception has limitations because of how we are wired. Again, Natural selection didn't design your mind to see the world clearly. Mm -mm. It designed your mind to have perceptions and beliefs that would help take care of your genes, period. Perception refers to our ability to organize, identify, and interpret the sensory information, our five senses, in order to make sense of something, the signal we are receiving. When we perceive, we are actually translating 
sensory information, which then gives rise to our view, our story of what is going on. So here are the limitations of our perception. We adopt beliefs that are largely untested based on conclusions inferred from what we observe. Our observations are influenced by past experience, which is to say, if we had a bad experience with the snake, and then uh, we see a rope on the ground, we might think it's a snake, right? Our ability to achieve the results we desire are also eroded by our feelings that our beliefs are the truth. Our beliefs are based on the real data. The truth is obvious and the data we select even though our perception is limited, is the real data. In other words, the only data that matters. So just uh, for the managers and leaders out there, you just think of it. If you're telling people what to do based on your limited perception, you are actually setting yourself up, not even realizing it, to get the results that you don't want because you are relying on information that is into, incomplete to begin with. So I have a fun factoid for you. Maybe some of you have heard this before. Our brains process only 40 bits of information per second, every minute of every day, a very small percentage of the 11 million pieces of information our senses are receiving. Given all that data, 11 million pieces of information, there is obviously not one reality. There are millions of possibilities that we could perceive and then interpret in every given second. That our perception is selective is just something we have to deal with because there are too many stimuli in the environment for us to observe. In other words, our human condition is that we screen out most of what we see, hear, taste, and feel. Um, so, uh, then it gets a little more complicated as we get into uh, some of the mind traps that managers and leaders get into. Um, how, how we are wired quite naturally sets us up to falling into leaner, leader mind traps. This is a term that Jennifer Garvey Berger uses in her latest book. Uh, and, and by the way, um, you can get a copy of these slides and all the references I used in preparing them. They're listed on the uh, last slide. So not only do we live in our story of I, me, and mine as we move in the world, we are trapped by simple stories that blind us to the real story of what's actually going on. Because of our limitations of perception, we only notice the things that jibe with our story. So I think I've hammered this point home, right? And when leaders put too much faith in their simple stories of what they think is going on, they project simplistic versions of the future. And these days, that can lead to ruinous results. Here's the implication that I want you to get. When we are trapped by simple stories, we seek simple solutions. The fact is, as this pandemic so starkly 
demonstrates. Not everything is fixable with the known knowledge we have today. In general, even before this pandemic, many of us felt over our heads because of our inability to at least somewhat reliably predict the future. We can't do that anymore with any predictability in this VUCA world. And this is especially challenging, by the way, for managers who want to solve problems and keep the trains running smoothly. When trapped by simple stories, we tend to end up going for the quick fix, which may work for some problems, but not for many of the challenges we face in the, in, today, including the coronavirus, replete with all its uh, complexity. In short, because the world changes so quickly, the future becomes far less predictable. We can't use the past as a measure to predict what's going to happen in the future. And then the options of what to do with what we think is going on become exponentially increased. And the way we need to think about these options is always going to shift. And I think you've seen examples of that today. There is much more information available in this interconnected world. So leaders now have to do things that they have never done before. And again, there's no possible way to predict what happens next. In short, we must be willing to change from holding on to our point of view, our simple story, just ask one question continually. And I borrowed this question from Edgar Schein in his book, Humble Inquiry. The question is, what else is going on? And then try to come up with a number of other stories that might explain what is going on. And that helps you to get out of the trap of a simple story. We're trapped by rightness. We want to be right. After all, we are the experts. This is how we got to where we are today. We were right a lot, right? Peter Senge said, New insights fail to get into practice because they conflict with deeply held internal images of how the world works. Images that limit us to familiar ways of thinking and acting. Again, that underscores the simple story. Again, the main point is, if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. So sorry about that. Leaders must be able to see new possibilities and take new actions to produce new results. So bottom line, just because it feels right doesn't mean it is right. If we are trapped by rightness, then we are not willing to change. So Listen closely, I'm gonna give you the antidote to being trapped by rightness. It's developing the habit of listening to learn from others rather than listening to win or listening to fix. This requires us to have the mindset of being in the question rather than the mindset of being in the answer as experts. <laughs> so by the way, um, <coughs> questioning 
is a foundational tool that we teach in our, our programs at key executive leadership programs. We can always be in the question, anytime, toward any experience. Um, and if we are in the question, we can go beyond being trapped by rightness. Yes, we can be in the question even in the face of what we're facing today. And here's something that's really important. Being in the question breaks down the very construction of this mind trap. And asking also engages the heart in the process. And I'll say more about engaging the heart in a bit. We are often apt by agreement, commonly referred to as groupthink. You're all familiar with groupthink, I think. Uh, it's a, it means the group is well-intentioned, uh, may, the, the group makes irrational or non-optimal decisions that are spurred by the urge to conform or to discourage any kind of dissent. So when a team is operating in a group think mode, it shuts down debate or alternative viewpoints. And so now you can begin to see how these mind traps connect to one another. The group will be committed to a certain point of view and will dismiss warning signs of contradictory data. And we all know what happened uh, with the famous group think, uh, the challenger, right? We see, we've often seen that video as an illustration of the worst of group think. At best, it, might score highly for things like team spirit <clears throat> and group identity, which are usually viewed as positive things, but it will not be a healthy decision-making environment and could be disastrous in times like these. Groupthink and longing for alignment robs you of hearing good ideas. In times that are uncertain and changing fast, too much agreement is a problem. So here's the antidote, listen carefully. <laughs> the antidote for being trapped by agreement is actually developing the habit of disagreeing. <laughs> Not to be mean, but actually to expand the solution set rather than agreeing to contract the solution set. Ah, here's a good one, trapped by control. You're often trapped by the need to control. Uh, last week in our key podcast, Monday, Monday Morning Meditations with Ruth, and I invite you to listen to those podcasts. We just started them. I, I urge leaders to uh, learn to let go of being in control and instead learn to set the boundaries so that others can step up to the plate to lead. Building collective intelligence is more important than ever. And the fact is, trying to take charge only strips you of influence. We may be happy when we think we are in control, on time and on budget, but in fearful times, replete with both complexity and change, as we said, we cannot control what will happen next, and there are too many interrelated parts. Especially for leaders um, who have risen up through an organization or in a single line of business, uh, managing a, a crisis can feel uh, quite thrilling. The trap is that the need for feeling in control 
often turns you to your optional comfort zone. Your adrenaline spikes as decisions are made and actions are taken. You know, this is kind of like a sugar high. But what you are not doing when this happens, when you're trapped by control, is taking the long view, which leading in fearful times requires. Okay, so here's the antidote, antidote for this one, for being trapped by control. Hope you're taking notes here. Uh, it's developing the habit of what Jennifer Garvey Berger and Keith Johnston in their book called Simple Habits calls experimenting at the edges, referring to safe to fail experiments. What makes an experiment safe to fail is that the leader thoughtfully constructs safety guardrails around the zone of play of the experiment, basically so, the, so that no one gets harmed. Here's our last leadership mind trap that I want to speak to. I bet there are more, and maybe you have already thought of some more. Ego relates very directly to the problem of I, me, and mine. <clears throat> uh, another way of saying ego. And I can tell you that our ego is very um, skillful, clever, and uh, many ways of showing up. We have, each of us, cultivated a certain way that works for us. And we have changed enormously through our lives to, go, to grow into this person that we are right now, right? We've worked hard to be me here now. <laughs> so we've actually arrived, you could say. And uh, we invest an incredible amount of energy. So the antidote for being trapped by ego, developing the habit of asking another key question, right? One of my favorite questions of all time, and people who I have coached have probably heard this. Here's the question. Who do I want to be next? You might want to jot that down. Want to be next. So, just think for a moment, just curious. Uh, could you could think about your, uh, do you have a mind trap of uh, choice? What do you think most keeps you from learning or being in the question? Is it a desire for a simple story? Being right, always looking for agreement, wanting to be in control, being trapped by ego. Uh, maybe you have uh, one or more. Thinking about the predominant leader mind trap, the one that speaks to you most, you could, um, and this is an exercise uh, do uh, after this talk, or maybe just think about it for a moment here. Think of specific examples of how you might employ the antidotes, also present the mind, right? And here they are here. And, and again, you'll, you can get these slides entertain different stories, listen to learn to self, self, I added that, and others, disagree respectfully to expand a solution set, experiment at the edges to generate new information and determine who you want to be next. So uh, good luck with those and uh, 
here's something else. I decided to give you some universal antidotes to leader of mind traps because they're easy. <laughs> and uh, they will be quite helpful. And I just want to take a few minutes to talk about these two uh, antidotes, which I call universal antidotes. One is reframing and one is mindfulness meditation. Okay. So we can learn and apply these and just doing these simple, actually tiny habits uh, can help us to become the leader we need to be in these fearful times. Uh, one is reframing and the other is mindfulness meditation, as I've, I've said. Uh, and why do they work? They work fundamentally because our hard, hard wiring, our mind traps and all of that are not fundamentally who we are. We are, and hear this, we are inherently awake. It is our inherent awareness that knows right now that, are, that you are listening to me right now. That's an example of inherent awareness. So I'm going to encourage you to hold yourself radically accountable for practicing the two habits you use because um, they will help us to become more interconnected, okay? They will help us to um, undo the damage of our mind traps that take us away from interconnection. And especially in these fearful times, we need to be interconnected to develop the collective intelligence that we need to even begin to face today's challenges. So let's first talk about uh, reframing. So every thought has a frame behind it. And it's a simple two-step process. You observe the negative thought and you replace it with a positive thought. I want to uh, stress, because uh, most of you uh, have, uh, who are key uh, know uh, quite well the emotional and social intelligence model. And uh, you know that one of the facets of emotional intelligence is uh, emotional regulation or self-management, that must competency in the model. Um, look, we don't have to go crazy with expressing our emotions, and we don't want to suppress them either, because that could have some destructive uh, consequences. So this uh, two-step process that you see here, reframing, reappraisal, reassessing, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's, it's reassessing an emotional situation in a very healthy way for the purpose of steadying our mind. So a frame is a mental model. It's a set of ideas and assumptions that you carry in your head, right? To help you to understand and uh, assemble things into a co coherent pattern. And if we fall into our mind traps or default to our hard wiring, um, we, we are falling into existing mental models. And so if we reframe, we can break out of our existing mental models and we can think about situations, people, events in a different way. So even today with what's going on today, you could think about the challenge, the problems that you're having with what's going on and you could reframe them not as problems but as challenges so a challenge is different than a threat for example a challenge frame of mind uh, builds resilience in the in the uh, face of stress and here are some very, very, very simple examples. You can just uh, scan these.
Got that, right? So uh, just for the fun of it, why don't you think of a frame or a mental model uh, statement that plays over and over again in your head? And just for the fun of it, you could uh, reframe it. Go ahead, do it. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. So we have a few comments coming in. Um, and yeah, just, uh, they want me to speed up and get it over with. Oh, no, we, we want some elaboration <laughs> and we want more information. Everyone's really enjoying um, the science aspect of your uh, presentation and are really taking in the content. And just to circle back a little bit, we had a question um, to elaborate a little bit on how to effectuate the antidote to control mind trap. Um, and what are some examples or suggestions for experimenting at the edges? Oh, okay. Um, uh, there's actually um, a wonderful, wonderful video that I'm going to send you the link to, to send out, that really gives some very concrete examples. I can say right now that you can go on to uh, YouTube and put in those keywords. Mm -hmm. um, safe to fail experiment or experiment at the edges and you'll you'll get Jennifer Garvey Berger herself giving giving you some really wonderful wonderful examples okay and I'll be sure to send that out to everyone yes um, and we also have a question on uh, the current topic reframing and the question specifically is how do you help others reframe um, well, you know, the coaches out there, this is what they do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they ask, uh, you know, people will say, uh, I have a good friend uh, who's lost a lot of money in the stock market. And uh, when he talks to me, uh, he'll say things like, uh, I'm going to die as a pauper. And um, I'm totally ruined, as if the world revolved around him. And uh, so I'll say, um, so what's another way of saying what you just said, right? And so he'll go, what, what? And so just, you just ask people, what's another way of looking at that? Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And then if they come up with another uh, bad example, like you just say, let's try again. What's another way of looking at that? And you never give up with people, right? Mm -hmm. And you might even give them an example of how you were able to reframe a challenge that you had and, and, and uh, the results that you got simply by reframing the challenge, the problem. Does that help? Yeah, and I think that kind of speaks to a couple of the other questions that we got in talking about um, how do you get people out of their own mindset trapped in they are always right or they always see the way things are and their decisions are always correct. Um, but we do have a follow-up question is that how do you do this when you don't have a coach or if you aren't a coach or if you're in a regular meeting? How, 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 what is the best way to go about doing it? Simple, simple, simple. This is all you have to do, mm -hmm. right? So someone's going on and on and on and on, right? And uh, all you have to do is pause and ask a question. And I would ask a very open-ended question to that person. Mm -hmm. Maybe a question that begins with the word what, not like, uh, why are you so disgusting or narrow-minded, right? That's not a question, really. Um, something like, uh, what's behind your statement? What are you really feeling? And, and what you're trying to do is to get someone to unlock from that mental space they're in. So a question is magical. It's the highest form of language, in my opinion. It sends people out into a bigger world that they, they wouldn't normally go to because they're trapped by their simple stories, for example, and the other mind traps. 
And so it sends them out into a bigger world to explore different points of the compass, you could say, right? So ask a question, ask an open-ended question and ask it from a curious frame of mind. And just this simple way of using language, and you might have to um, write yourself a little note to make sure you do that because uh, you know we're hardwired. <laughs> so we're trying to uh, create new neural pathways in our brain. And so we're trying to create the neural pathway of being in the question. So um, I think you can find that, uh, you know, we have a professor at Key, uh, Marilee Adams, who wrote a book called Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. Literally, uh, being in the qu question uh, can change your life and it can model that behavior for others. So it has a real impact on others as well. Don't think you know the answer, by the way, right? That's a mind trap. Um, mindless uh, meditation practice uh, uh, does help us to emerge from the embeddedness of our leader mind traps. And I was actually, by the way, here's the uh, definition of mindfulness meditation, paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So our emotions are absent, right? We just see what's going on, right? So, um, so and, and honestly, I'm gonna say that I think this is the ultimate uh, antidote and resilience booster because it's portable, you can do it anywhere. Um, it's teachable, you, you can learn it very quickly and I can teach it to you now. I think we're gonna have to come to that choice though. <laughs> And, uh, or you could listen to the podcasts that have started because um, you'll certainly get lots of mindfulness lessons. There are many kinds of uh, mindfulness is a form of meditation and you'll be learning uh, lots of meditations in our, in our weekly podcasts. Um, again, it's portable, it's teachable. I can, I can teach you in a few minutes. Uh, it's free. <laughs> and uh, Interestingly, it's been on the market for almost 3,000 years, so it does have uh, staying power and shelf life. If you uh, want to see how mindfulness works, actually, why don't we do this? If it's okay, I'd like to show you a short video that says a lot in a very few minutes. Would, would you guys be up for that? What do you think, Bree, Lamont? Yeah? Short video? Yep, we can go for it. All right, let's, uh, hopefully this connection will be okay. And then if you want to have a, a brief lesson and after that, I'll think of something really quick that we can just do in our chairs. Hang on a second here. Hopefully this comes across loud and clear. Mindfulness works is by looking into the circuitry of the brain. And so we all have actually a handy model of the brain, <laughs> which is at hand. <laughs> so if you take your hand and fold your thumb into the middle of your palm and your fingers over, this would be an example of a brain where the person's eyes are here, the top of their head is here, their brain uh, is connected to the body itself at the spinal cord, which is represented in your, in your wrist. The way uh, composed, its architecture, helps us understand how mindfulness works. If you lift your, lift your thumb up, we go to the first part of the brain in the skull, which is here called the brain stem. And this is where you have uh, elation of the body and where you also have the fight, flight, and freeze response are created. This area of the brain stem, very primitive area, works together with the next area that's on top of it, the limbic area, and this is run by the thumb. The limbic area helps generate our emotions. There are parts of it that help us feel our feelings, 
Um, we also distinguish different aspects of memory. And in particular, this limbic response to our relationships. Okay, now this limbic area and brainstem area, they work together. And because these are below the next area of the brain, the cortex, we call them cortical. A lot of our impulses, our all behaviors, our just innate learned reactions to things, our instincts, are driven by these subcortical areas, including information that comes up from the body itself. Your heart beating, your intestines churning, feed up the limbic area in the brainstem and get you all revved up. So that's a kind of loop that creates what we call our emotional state. The cortex developed when we became mammals also as the limbic area did but the front part of this cortex from your second to last knuckles down to your fingernails front part developed when we became primates and this part where your fingernails are is called the prefrontal cortex because it's the front most part of the frontal lobe this is the part that's most developed in humans and this part that gives the ability to pause before acting on an impulse and the way it works is there are fibers that come down middle prefrontal area that actually calm the irritable limbic area or brainstem area. Literally, this prefrontal region regulates the lower subcortical limbic brainstem and even the bodily areas. So anyways, what we think happens is mindful awareness practice creates a state of active moment that in a way harnesses the power of this prefrontal area in that moment. Actually practice something. That state can become a trait because neurons which are together wire together. So with the strengthening of this prefrontal area, what happens is, for example, if a child is angry and the brainstem is activating a fight response, the limbic area works with that to develop a feeling of fear there's a sense of betrayal that happens when you're burning up, your heart is pounding, and everything is going to get you to fight, to get a knife, to get a gun, to hit someone, to do something really violent. But your prefrontal cortex, as you pause, and the very parts of the brain that allow you to pause are also the same part of the brain, this middle area, that allows you to have insight into what's going on. My heart's pounding, I'm really angry. Empathy for someone else, Maybe that guy didn't mean it, or maybe he's doing the best he can. And then even a sense of morality. So when we develop the middle prefrontal areas, we actually can not only pause, but we can think of the larger social good and enact a behavior that's better for everyone. And that's where mindfulness really alters things like bullying, like violent acts of aggression. And it's where mindfulness can change the world, literally, one person, one relationship at a time. So I think the connection, the connection there might have been a little slow uh, at times. Uh, hopefully you got the core message of that uh, quick video. And uh, so, now we are coming up to the end of our talk, and here's what I propose, and uh, maybe handlers will tell me what I'm allowed to do here, okay? So I could give you a quick mindfulness lesson, and we could just practice together for minutes, and then I would wrap up the talk. We'll get to the questions maybe a little after one. You up for that? Let me see. I'm some guidance here. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Okay, so uh, so let's let's do this, and I'm gonna get my timer so I don't forget what time it is. Okay, so just just take a comfortable seat. Right, sit. Try not to lean back in your chair. Just take a comfortable seat. Some of you probably like to do mindfulness practice on the floor, cross-legged. Do it, whatever works for you. You could even lie down, right? The idea is just relax and imagine that you just shoveled your entire driveway of snow, which I could have done recently in Vermont. Um, or you just think of when you just finished um, 
climb, doing a long hike and you arrived at the peak of the mountain that you were climbing, okay? Whoa, just sit, relaxed, completely open. And uh, don't try and block your thoughts, emotions, or any sensations that are arising in your body. Just, just be present. And whatever arises, think of it like this. Whatever arises are like clouds passing before the sun. You all know that the clouds are not par part of the sun. Sometimes they obscure the sun, only they are not part of the sun, right? So whatever arises, I just, you just sit there, resting in open awareness. Just sit, notice the clouds. They arise from nowhere, they dwell. Sometimes they're stronger because there's an emotion, a strong emotion attached, um, but they go away, okay? So let's, uh, let's just sit that way for a few minutes together. And I'm going to put on my meditation app here. And oops, this says five minutes, huh? No, I have to, I have to reset this. How about if we do it for, I'm gonna say two minutes, okay? Let's just begin now. Resting in open awareness. You can keep your eyes open or closed. Isn't that nice? I do that uh, in the morning. Here's what's so magical about what we just did. And again, there are, I know, hundreds of forms of uh, practice, which I'll be uh, teaching yes, on Monday mornings. Here's the magic that I wanted to call to your attention. Uh, What's really great news is that mindfulness meditation has a dizzyingly long list of correlates. And by that I mean other stuff comes about when you're doing this simple practice, just like we did, just did. And you can see some of the correlates based on broadly on the three uh, main tenets that you see listed here on the slide. I can find a meaningful purpose in my life. I can influence my surroundings and the outcome of events. 
both positive and negative experiences will lead to learning and growth. You quite naturally fall into that learner mindset. Your story of me quite naturally falls away. You might discover you actually are not who you think you are. Okay. Social psychologists uh, often use the term hardiness, hardiness, H-A-R-D-I-N-E-S-S, -S, or heartiness, E-A-R-T-I-N-E-S-S, -S, uh, when referring to these uh, tenants that you see here. The more we build our hardiness or heartiness, the less uh, control our hard wiring and our mind traps have over us. So I think ultimately the greatest gift of mindfulness practice is uh, it's magic through discipline. I mean, it doesn't happen if you just do it once. It's discipline uh, of making the unseen seen. We discover our hard wiring and we soften. And most importantly, we get off uh, automatic pilot. So it's a, it's a great practice. Let me uh, make a few summary remarks and then we could go to questions if you like. So you know what this is, right? It's a, a Venn diagram. So you could say that one circle uh, represents the present and the other circle represents the future. And so if our <laughs> hard wiring and our mind traps rule us, uh, when crisis strikes, um, even if the two circles largely overlap, um, the, in a crisis, the two circles start to uh, separate as the crisis event unfolds over the arc of time. I guess you could say the circles never completely separate um, because the present and the future are interdependent. Um, the point is we're, we're stuck in our hard wiring, stuck in our mind traps. We can neither be skillful in the present, nor are we able to to take the long view, which is necessary for the future of our planet. Uh, I leave you with this final thought, um, which I deeply believe managers and leaders and just us as human beings, we cannot move forward without working on our minds, without steadying our minds, we cannot move forward without being in the question. And we cannot move forward without getting into the realm of the heart. And by heart, I mean our basic awareness. So I think, um, do you have any questions? I would love to hear comments, by the way, if we could. Here's some of those too. Share our knowledge. I, I saw some of the names that, that uh, of people entering the, the room, and uh, there's a, a lot of very smart people out there. <laughs> so I'll and turn it have, over to you, Bree. Yeah, we have a lot of familiar names in our um, our participant list today, and we do have a couple of questions just to circle back to an earlier part of your presentation. Um, one question is, how do you check your own ego as a leader? Do you have any tools, tips, or specific techniques for that? I practice mindfulness and reframing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change. I've been doing it for more years than most of you have lived. And um, that's how I do it. You, 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 can't, uh, you can't work with your e ego with your conceptual mind because your ego is always tricking your, your ego and your conceptual mind are the same. Your, your ego will always trick you. 
So these are the ways you out trick your ego. Mm -hmm. you, and you know, you don't have to do mindfulness meditation, okay? That's my centering practice of choice. I recommend that you find a centering practice of choice. And I'm guessing that some of you already have one. Maybe um, some people like to pray. Some people like to, um, <laughs> I, knew, I knew someone who loved to go kayaking and be out there in his kayak, you know? Um, just find a, a journaling, that's a great one, right? So find a centering practice that works for you and that will help you to steady your mind. Yeah. Yeah, and kind well, of related to that, we have, oh, sorry, we have someone who's really enthusiastic about meditation and they had it, um, a similar experience. They did a five minute meditation session in one of their executive leadership classes and they just want to hear more of your thoughts on meditation and using it in the classroom, in the professional setting as well. Uh, yes. Well, um, you could, um, oh goodness, I, I, I go around to lots of federal agencies and do mindfulness workshops, right? And, and uh, it's, it's, it's now, today, mindfulness is very much associated with wellness and uh, and people just start doing it, instituting it, and, and you know, following along with some instructions or an app, you know. Um, but uh, I guess there are some books, and I would recommend, and I, I could send out um, some suggested reading uh, uh, that could help you to get started. Yes. Does that answer the question sufficiently? Um, I think so. Um, a lot of people are asking for resources, additional resources that they can look into to learn more about this topic. So I think that would be great. Um, well, tell them to come to key executive leadership programs. We do mindfulness <laughs> workshops all the time. That's great. Those people, and the, those I don't know if there's anyone from TSA out there, but um, the people that went to our J-band programs and K-band programs, they got into mindfulness quite a bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But certainly, yes, I'll, I'll write myself a note. My action item is to send you some simple, basic resources that can get you started. And I'm happy to do that. Great. And another comment we have is, one effect of the current pandemic is people's feelings that they have no control. And even that fear controls them. What are some techniques you recommend that we as leaders can communicate to others to empower them with a greater sense of control and a way to mitigate fear. Okay, so let me tell you right now, um, probably something you don't want to hear. And we, it was, and we talked about the mind trap of control, right? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that um, the feeling that you are in control is your ego. You are not in control. As a matter of fact, if you look up where you're sitting and you look up to that ceiling that's above you somewhere, right? If you're, I assume you're sitting in your home maybe listening to this, that ceiling could fall on your head right now, right? So, so the idea is there, there, we, we want to let go of being in control and just being present with a steady mind so that in that moment of being present, because now is the, the time that matters. When you're, when you're fearful about control, where's your mind? Your mind is worried about what happened in the past. Oh my God, I hope that doesn't happen again. Or what's gonna happen in the future? Oh, I hope that doesn't happen again. When you are completely present now, that fear goes away. So the, the point is how to learn to be on the spot, not erratically, you know, because we're, we're very present lots of time, more often, right? And, and that's what practices like mindfulness can help with. Does that help a little? I don't mean to be preachy about this. I do think though that uh, leaders need to find some kind of centering practice mm -hmm. that's regular, it's a discipline, it requires discipline, yes. 
And to take a step back to the Venn diagram, someone asked if you could just uh, recap what was said about the present and future related to that slide. Ah, Venn diagram. Okay, so uh, let's see if I can back there. Here we are. That's probably the most simple slide I've ever made. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so it, and I, I just thought I would use the Venn diagram as a metaphor. Uh, one circle representing the present and the other circle rep representing the future. And if our hardwiring and our mind traps, our ego, uh, rules us, uh, when a crisis strikes, then um, that, those two circles uh, start to move apart. And they don't connect in, in a good way, right? I guess they never fully uh, separate because the present and the future are interdependent um, but we but the idea is uh, related to the circles if we are not present if our mind is not uh, steady we cannot be skillful in the present nor can we um, be be able to hold the long view which is very critical now because we're all sort of like panicky in the present no we have to take our seat and also hold the long view right because, uh, you know, what else is going on here, right? And we have to be able to anticipate the obstacles that arise and things like that. So uh, we have to, uh, in order to be in the present, we have to uh, work on our minds, have a centering practice and be in the question and, and apply the antidotes, the universal ones and the ones uh, related to the specific mind traps. Boy, I'd like to hear more of the wisdom that's out there. Does anyone want to, can, Bree, can you invite anyone to speak? Yeah, we have, uh, we have another question that just came in, but in the meantime, if anyone wants to speak directly to Ruth and to everyone listening, please feel free to use the raise your hand feature. Um, and if you can't find that, then you can send the chat to the host and then we'll find you on our participant list specifically to unmute you. Um, but yeah, going into the question that we just got regarding mindfulness, can you please further explain how to, to process thoughts during the meditation? My okay. brain is always thinking, so I struggle with constant thoughts. Yeah, and the, and the scary news is that when you really get into mindfulness, the, the noise is going to get louder before it gets softer. So um, just say the last part of that question again for me, Bree. My brain is always thinking, so I struggle with constant thoughts. Yeah, okay, okay. So let me tell you, number one, you cannot stop your thoughts. The only way you can do that is you can take a baseball bat and you can knock yourself unconscious and your thoughts will stop. I, I would not recommend that. That's kind of draft, drastic. So the thinking, this is what I'm trying to say, the thinking is the phenomenal play of the mind. Okay, I, now remember what I said. It's like the clouds. They are not part of the mind, right? They're not part of the sun. So when your thoughts arise, they arise from nowhere. They dwell, like maybe you're sitting there now and you, um, thinking you're all paying attention. I don't think so. I think my, many of you are saying, I better cut out now, it's lunchtime, right? Or something like that. So they just, it's, it's just like, uh, you know, noise, uh, radio playing in the background. That's how our minds are. So the idea is that we sit and we simply notice. We, we beca become sensitive to the thoughts arising, dwelling, and disappearing. There are gaps between thoughts. And I can tell you through practice, the gaps get bigger. And you are resting in open awareness. It takes practice. Maybe we could, um, when we all, we, we could, I, we, I would say, listen to the podcast for now, because this is what we do on the podcast, or we'll be doing, 
um, is actually practice working with our minds, okay? And there's a way you can uh, submit questions. I think Bree will uh, advise you. And, you know, I, I would love your questions and I would love to talk to you. And um, so hopefully we've whetted your appetite with uh, this talk. We have another question that just came in. Um, what is the role of gratitude and the universal antidotes you offered earlier? Gratitude. You know, that is, there are so many practices and gratitude is a wonderful practice. Um, if you uh, get up in the morning and you write, or you have journal and you write down what you're grateful for, you know, one thing, like, uh, I'm grateful for my dog, Suki. I'm uh, grateful for that wonderful cup of coffee this morning. I'm grateful that the snow that's coming off my roof didn't land on my head. So if we just write down these things that we're grateful for, then we begin to have um, a more positive uh, feeling about our day altogether. And I, I say more joyful rather than happy because happy is uh, dependent on external conditions, whether we got that raise or whatever. Um, joyful is a way of being apart from any external conditions. It is possible. It's possible. And going off the topic of gratitude, um, someone shared a quote, uh, gratitude and resentment cannot coexist from Henry Newbin. If you wanna share your thoughts on that. So, so what was that? Um, the quote is gratitude and resentment cannot coexist. Yes. H have that person explain why, brilliant, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like love and hate can't exist at the same time, right? And another question we have is, can you speak on forgiveness, fear, and freedom? <laughs> oh, sure. Do you have two days? Uh, <laughs> uh, forgiveness? Uh, I'd actually uh, would like to know um, there's a lot behind that question, and uh, for me to answer it um, or address it, I would have to know a little more <laughs> from this person if they were willing to share. Does that person want to say more? We could get into a discussion, maybe even. Um, so they said to, to clarify, lack of forgiveness breeding fear. Yeah, well, lack of forgiveness is based on fear, is it not? Right? There's some, you know, ultimately, whether we call it anxiety or whatever, the things that lock us into things like lack of forgiveness, when it comes right down to it, is some kind of fear. And usually we don't like to go. We don't want to lean into it. We want to go away from it. That's why we're so busy entertaining ourselves a lot. <laughs> so that we don't have to go to those places. But um, lack of forgiveness is based on some kind of fear. Yeah. Uh, Bree, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I didn't uh, quite uh, give a full answer on that last one, but I'd be happy to hear from that person directly. Um, I, I, I just thought of a fun exercise that I could leave people with too, and, and then maybe take a few more questions. I, just, uh, just to show you that your mind is really, when you're open, it's, it's, it, you can do so much. You can just change everything, right? So I'm gonna encourage people when they get up in the morning, uh, they get out of bed and they put their two feet on the ground to get out of bed, um, they're going to say out loud to themselves, Today is going to be a great day. And then, to no one, just smile. 
and see what happens. We have another comment um, from the same person who asked about forgiveness. Yes, yes, please. Um, to be more specific, um, so lack of forgiveness, breeding fear, freedom from acknowledgement of past hurts towards others and yourself. Look, uh, this, yeah, here's the thing. I, I, I'm gonna answer it this way, and it, there's, there's much more here. There's something, there's a lot here. And, and there's a lot of pain here too. That's what I think. But I think if you can get into uh, a regular practice, and I'm speaking to everyone here, if you can get into a regular practice, um, just sitting, you know, and maybe reading some, uh, I'll send you some things to read that you can contemplate, you know, some meditations you can contemplate. Remember I was saying there are a lot of correlates to just doing this simple thing. And, I don't know how it works. I just know that there are these correlates. But what happens though is you also start to soften. You start just by sitting down, taking your seat every day and sitting there for a few minutes, you start to um, develop a compassion for yourself. And once that compassion first towards self happens, it's almost organic. You start being compassionate toward others. It's just organic the way it happens. And then those, those, that rigidity of um, fear and all of that, um, it becomes when the softening happens, it becomes workable. Say it like that. You have to sit though, or do whatever is your centering, centering practice. So I think that's all the questions that we have for now. Um, but if anyone wants to jump in, please do use the raise your hand feature. We have a couple of minutes left and I just wanna, reiterate that um, we do have the Monday Mindfulness Podcast with Ruth, so please join in for that and can learn all about mental resilience and more meditation practices. Yeah, Ruth, if you have any other comments or... No, only to um, really um, to thank everybody for um, joining in. It was my pleasure and my honor to do this, and um, I will get those... Uh, resources to you maybe some books to read whatever and um and you can uh, i can give you my email and you can ask me questions directly whatever and um just to thank you thank you it's it's this time is hard for all of us and these opportunities for connecting are so 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 precious so thank you again